Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. My name is Derry Fitzgerald, and it is my pleasure to present today's webinar, which is part of the European Global Project, supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. We have the honour to have as our guest today, the Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, and he's going to speak on peacekeeping for approximately 20 minutes. Before I hand over to Secretary General Lacroix, um, I'd like to do some housekeeping issues with you. Um, you will be able to join us on uh, Zoom using your Q&A function. And please feel free to send in your questions as they occur to you during the presentation. Um, also, we will get to all of those questions after the presentation. Um, please, you are also invited to join us on um, Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Both the presentation and the questions will be on the record. And we are also live streaming today's presentation. So a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us via YouTube. Now let me introduce uh, Under Secretary General Jean-Pierre. Uh, he was appointed as Secretary General to, um, as appointed Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping by the Secretary General Antonio Antonio Guterres in 2017. Prior to that, uh, during the years 2014 to 2017, uh, Mr. Lacroix served as Director for United Nations, International Organizations, Human Rights and Francophone at the French Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Other appointments uh, include Ambassador of France to Sweden, the Chief of Protocol of France, and the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission uh, to the United Nations in New York. Now let me say a few words by way of talking about peacekeeping. It has been written that the UN peacekeeping has become and is a remarkable achievement for the multilateral system. And it is likely to remain one of the most visible symbols of global governance and international cooperation. Yet in 2022, we have seen a marked shift in the severity of intra and interstate conflict, and therefore the security for the peacekeepers and the environment in which they operate has changed and deteriorated. In tandem with this marked change, we have certain tensions that have been, uh, I suppose, increased in among the permanent members of the Security Council. But yet, the UN and under uh, Under Secretary General Jean Pierre, the UN has moved to address and mitigate the current and future challenges by bringing forward new actions for peacekeeping and for being prepared to strengthen these new actions to ensure that the effectiveness of peacekeeping is maintained. Under Secretary General will discuss the current state of UN peacekeeping, the challenge it is facing, and what, is more is, what more is needed to ensure that we use this unique multilateral tool to its maximum use. Under Secretary General, you are most welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good morning. I am very honored to be uh, invited by uh, the Institute of International and European Affairs. And I certainly look forward to this discussion and, and to your questions. Um, but let me begin by saying uh, a few words about uh, where peacekeeping uh, is today. Um, we have 12 uh, peacekeeping missions. Um, the, uh, they're very different. Uh, some of them are 
uh, small in size or relatively small. I mean, a few uh, hundred uh, uh, personnel. Uh, I believe the smallest is probably uh, the, the mission we have uh, um, in uh, uh, the Kashmir area called Anmo Gip, which is an old uh, uh, observation mission. Um, and, and we have large missions that are uh, uh, that, 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 that are uh, um, almost with a budget of one uh, billion dollar per year each and uh, and, and a level of staff close to 20 or around 20,000 personnel, military, civilian and police. Uh, those missions are also very different in uh, regarding their mandates. Uh, to simplify uh, a bit, uh, we have uh, these traditional peacekeeping missions or so-called traditional peacekeeping missions whose mandates are essentially about monitoring ceasefires, uh, the likes of Cyprus or Western Sahara, to a certain extent, UNIFIL, and uh, also the one that I mentioned, Unmogip, as well as Andov on the uh, Golan Heights. And we also have so-called uh, multi-dimensional uh, missions with a, a much broader mandate that cover uh, not only uh, the uh, support to uh, ceasefires or whenever they exist, but also, and very much importantly so, the protection of civilians, the support to political efforts aimed at achieving a long lasting and durable peace, capacity building, as well as uh, monitoring and reporting on human rights and, and, and many other uh, mandated tasks. Um, but I think in spite of uh, all uh, these differences, um, I think it's very important to emphasize that uh, in the end, every single peacekeeping operation is political and has a political purpose because they're all aimed at either creating or preserving conditions for political efforts to be taken forward with a view to reaching uh, a durable solution to uh, those situations in which we are involved. And this is where uh, we, we have uh, a uh, problem on which I will elaborate a bit more uh, moving uh, forward, but I think it's very important to emphasize this political nature of peacekeeping. Now, um, much of this discussion will be about the challenges that peacekeeping operations are facing, and rightly so. But I think it's equally important to emphasize uh, the achievements, the past, and most importantly, the present achievements of peacekeeping operations. In, in the past, uh, many countries have been uh, successfully supported, uh, and I think the key word is supported, uh, um, by peacekeeping operation in uh, moving from a situation of crisis towards uh, a durable peace. And you have many such examples, uh, like um, Cambodia, Angola, Mozambique, El Salvador, Cote d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm not saying that these countries do not have uh, any problem. Of course they do. Uh, and, and most countries in the world have problems. But uh, with the help of uh, peacekeeping operation, they reached a stage where uh, peacekeeping operations became uh, irrelevant uh, to uh, their situation and, uh, and a stage where uh, a more stable uh, and peaceful situation had been achieved. And I'm saying the support is a key word because it was, this was, yes, with the support of peacekeeping operation, but that was not done by peacekeeping operations alone. And I will also uh, elaborate further on this critical importance of partnership uh, for uh, the success of peacekeeping. Now, uh, today, uh, it is much more difficult for uh, peacekeeping operations to see uh, the achievement of durable peace. And that's because we have a more divided international community. I will get back to that later. But at the same time, uh, the, in, the achievements of our peacekeepers on a day-to-day -day basis are, I believe, uh, very significant and they need to be emphasized. One of them is protection of civilians, uh, because uh, our missions, and particularly in those big missions in Africa, do protect and, and probably make the difference between life and death uh, for 
uh, hundreds of thousands of civilians. They support humanitarian assistance, they uh, protect uh, IDPs and refugees, uh, and they do create areas of enhanced security where uh, the civilians can uh, return to uh, their normal lives. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, protection of, of civilian is uh, 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 an issue where expectations are always very high and uh, peacekeeping operations are not always able to meet these expectations, but uh, yet the achievement of our peacekeepers regarding protection of civilian is uh, are very significant and, and I, I see that every time I go to the field and I meet the, 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 the population that are protected by our peacekeepers and I see and I hear from them, you know, how much of a difference those peacekeepers have made. Equally important is the preservation and, uh, and, and monitoring of ceasefire. Uh, I do believe that uh, if you remove uh, a peacekeeping operations such as uh, UNFISIP in Cyprus or, or UNIFIL in Lebanon or um, or, or the operation in Western Sahara, you're likely to see a much more tense and potentially very dangerous situation on the ground. Uh, and, and that's because these operations perform a unique function of liaising, deterring, uh, preventing uh, incidents from escalating, and that is absolutely critical to preserve peace. And of course, I should also mention the uh, achievement when it comes to building capacities, but of course building state capacity is important, but we need to have political space to do that and uh, the monitoring uh, and uh, uh, reporting on, on human rights, however challenging and difficult this may be. Now, um, let's go to the challenges. Uh, I mean, those Many of these challenges are not new, actually. Uh, uh, in fact, I mean, the peacekeeping operation, by definition, is deployed uh, in situations in areas that are challenged in, in many ways. Uh, but I would point out that uh, uh, over the last couple of years, indeed, those challenges have become more uh, daunting. And, and uh, there are a number of reasons for that. <clears throat> I think. Uh, one of them, and the most important one, is again a political challenge. I mentioned the fact that uh, when peacekeeping was successful, uh, and, and fully successful, meaning that peacekeeping was able to achieve its ultimate goal, which is uh, the achievement of durable political situation, and then being able to uh, eventually downgrade and leave. Uh, well, this can be achieved only if uh, our uh, work is strongly supported by other partners, particularly by our member states, so the most influential ones or the, uh, in a given situation, of course, that can be regional partners or, or permanent members of the Security Council or, or any other member with the member states with an influence. And that uh, works when the international community is uh, united and committed to be act actively involved in those political efforts. However, we have an increasingly divided international community, which and an increasingly divided Security Council, and therefore uh, a membership and partners who are less willing and less able to actually engage actively in support of the political efforts that are absolutely critical to achieve durable peace. And, and this is absolutely uh, significant because uh, parties to a conflict and particularly parties to an agreement um, will only move forward if they are incentivized, encouraged, and indeed sometimes pressured to do so. But with a divided international community, with the divided uh, membership, uh, it is uh, much. Uh, uh, it is very rare, actually, to 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 uh, to have that kind of united support uh, for those political efforts. Yes, of course, the Security Council and the General Assembly are still united enough to uh, give us our mandates or to extend our mandates and to give us finances. And this is, of course, important. Although I saw that uh, more, there are more cases where our mandates are extended by the Security Council without unanimity, which itself is an indication that uh, we have less united support. So this is, this is the major challenge. And it, it comes back to the fact that, you know, what we call the primacy of politics, that in the end, you know, all peacekeeping operation uh, is about 
supporting political efforts is about uh, politics and therefore a lack of uh, political uh, commonality amongst our membership is absolutely uh, critical to, to us and, 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 and a major problem. But in addition to that, of course, peacekeeping operations are facing increasingly uh, challenging threats on the ground. Um, and that is because uh, we are facing uh, more um, armed groups that are not necessarily interested in any uh, political uh, efforts or, or you know which have no political purpose uh, we we see that every day particularly in our missions in africa where uh, many of the armed groups that are after us and after the population we protect uh, are essentially about uh, uh, illegal exploitation of natural resources uh, or um, sometime uh, combined with uh, uh, ideological sort of uh, veneer or, or terrorist purposes um, uh, and uh, most of these armed groups are uh, actually happy to continue with chaos. They're not particularly interested in peace efforts, actually. They, 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 they thrive on, on chaos and uh, on uh, looting and, and going after the civilian population and terrorizing them. And, 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 and therefore, it makes it very difficult to engage them. Um, but in addition to that, uh, uh, the, the, the ways in which our peacekeepers are threatened uh, are also evolving and, and we're facing more uh, threats such as the uh, improvised explosive devices, not only in Mali, which has been characterized for quite a number of years by uh, the predominance of that threat, but also uh, in other mission as well. We're faced with uh, uh, more sophisticated threats uh, um, in the form of uh, uh, the use of drone to uh, uh, recognize our camps, uh, attacks sophisticated attacks against our camps, and so on and so forth. And uh, the equally important and, and dangerous threats of fake news and misinformation, which uh, uh, can potentially uh, kill not only peacekeepers, but also uh, civilian population and uh, enhance uh, and, and exacerbate uh, divisions and tensions uh, uh, across communities and uh, and um, you know in, in in the areas where we are deployed and, and all of this of course is enhanced by the new uh, tools that are the disposal of uh, those spoilers the new technologies the uh, um, the, the the use of social networks the uh, I mentioned the drones and all these easy to obtain tools that are now making uh, these uh, groups and these um, uh, th these actors uh, in a much better position to uh, threaten our uh, peacekeepers and, and the population we, we protect. Um, now, uh, in addition to that, uh, I think uh, it's clear that we're also facing uh, a number of drivers of conflict that are uh, gradually acquiring uh, a greater importance. One of them is definitely climate change, and we're seeing uh, particularly, but not only in our African mission, that uh, the impact of climate change uh, uh, is uh, results in a heightened tension between communities because it's a, it, it results in a greater exacerbated competition for natural resources such as land, water, and so on and so forth. And, um, and, and we're seeing uh, this, uh, as I said, very much so in, in, in South Sudan, in, in, in Mali, in the Central African Republic. <clears throat> We're also seeing the uh, increasing importance of uh, uh, transnational criminal activities, uh, trafficking in drugs, weapons, human beings, and so on and so forth, the, the looting of uh, natural resources, and how uh, this uh, contributes uh, uh, to uh, exacerbating tension and, 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 and further uh, destabilizing the, the region in which uh, we are operating. And all of this compounded by uh, pre-existing ethnic tensions and so on and so forth. Um, and, and faced with these uh, increasing challenges and or increasingly important drivers of conflict, and I should also add the uh, impact of the pandemic and now the, the war in Ukraine, uh, peacekeeping has uh, uh, always had um, 
a discrepancy between the, the mission it's been given and, and the capacities. And, and this has been so for, uh, for quite a long time. But of course, uh, the more these challenges uh, become uh, uh, daunting and, 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 uh, and significant, and, and the more uh, these issue with capacities need to be uh, addressed. Now, uh, let me turn to uh, how we could tried, we were trying to respond to these uh, challenges. Um, when uh, we uh, started, uh, I, I started in, in 2017, and more or less at the same time with Secretary General Antonio Guterres, um, the, the, the Secretary General launched, uh, first of all, uh, an initiative on the safety and security of our peacekeepers. And that was uh, because we, we had um, uh, an increasingly high numbers of fatalities and injuries uh, uh, amongst our peacekeepers, particularly resulting from uh, uh, IEDs. Um, and there was an action plan that was uh, devised to, to address this issue. But then we uh, expanded, we, 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 we went quickly to a second phase, which was to expand uh, this to uh, a broader initiative aimed at um, candidly sharing uh, the uh, challenges and issues that we were facing with peacekeeping with our member states uh, and engaging in uh, concerted and collaborative efforts with our member state to address these challenges. And that was the purpose of the so-called Action for Peacekeeping Initiative. Um, now, the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative uh, uh, led to uh, many uh, different work strands, uh, ranging from uh, working on improving the capacities, improving training, um, improving the way in which uh, we uh, um, strengthen conduct and discipline, and we address uh, the particularly the issue of uh, sexual exploitation and abuse in peacekeeping. Um, also, um, and, and this is very much about uh, improving the effectiveness of peacekeeping uh, and increasing the number and role of women in peacekeeping operations. And uh, a, a number of other work strands, including uh, greater support to uh, health uh, and medical support to our peacekeepers, uh, and, um, and, and also working on uh, um, lowering the environmental footprint of peacekeeping. The, all these uh, actions being, uh, particularly the latter, being very closely coordinated with the sister department uh, um, within the Secretariat, which is called the Department of Operational Support. Now, uh, last year, we uh, it was three years after the implementation of the, uh, uh, or the start of the implementation of the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative, which, by the way, uh, was uh, uh, supported by a foundational department, the document, which we call the Declaration of Shared Commitment, uh, and which was endorsed by 154 member states. Uh, again, this the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative is very much about um, making it clear that uh, the Secretariat has responsibilities in working to address the challenges that peacekeeping faces, but so have uh, member states. Uh, we very much rely on member states and engagement and support to help us address these challenges. Now, last year, we took stock of what we had achieved. We um, uh, and, and we decided that uh, our priorities needed to be updated and, uh, and focus on uh, uh, what I would call perhaps the, the highest angling fruits, I mean, the, the, the more systemic issues which were still requiring more efforts. And, and we, can't, we came up with the set of uh, new updated priorities, which uh, we uh, regroup under the umbrella of the so-called Action for Peacekeeping Plus initiative. Now, again, uh, these priorities are um, uh, th these priorities are the following. First, uh, again, the political dimension. Uh, we want to insist on that, uh, not necessarily because these are this is the issue on which we have uh, the, the the biggest leverage, but this is by way of again impressing upon our member states uh, that ultimately uh, all peacekeeping missions are about political efforts, and we need more political support from our member states for these political efforts. But we also identify a number of other priorities uh, uh, in this effort to update our, our, our uh, work strand. 
One of them is integration because peacekeeping operations, particularly the multi-dimensional one, are complex. They involve civilian, police, uh, and, and military personnel, but also humanitarian uh, colleagues and, and other partners working in the field, such as uh, other regional, sub-regional organization, and how to make sure that we work in a more integrated manner. We also uh, determined that uh, communication and countering fake news and disinformation uh, has to be a, a, a priority um, because of the increased uh, uh, importance and significance of that threats uh, of that threat on our peacekeeping operations. We also determined that we need to do make more efforts on uh, what I call. Uh, information gathering, situational awareness, and how to be more effective, more integrated, again, on collecting information with a view to better prevent threats against ourselves and against civilians, and then be able to act upon these threats in a way that is effective and coordinated. Uh, we also, of course, confirmed the importance of uh, continuing our work on increasing the role and number of women in peacekeeping, where I believe we're doing good, you know, we're gradually increasing uh, the number of women in peacekeeping, but we need to do more, and there are certain areas where it's proving to be more difficult, and particularly the senior military leaders as well as military contingent. Another key priorities which we highlighted and for which we now have established a strategy is to make sure that peacekeeping will make the better use, the best use of uh, uh, existing new technologies. And that is why we developed a strategy for the, uh, the digital transformation of peacekeeping um, uh, with a number of sub priorities having to do with, uh, again, uh, information gathering, uh, fake news, communication, and so on and so forth. But the purpose is really to make sure that we would enhance the digital literacy of peacekeeping and that we would be able, again, to make the best use of the new digital tools. Now, uh, all of this, of course, will continue to require the support of our uh, uh, member states in many ways. Uh, uh, support in terms of capacities, because we still lack capacities, particularly at the, as the needs of peacekeeping operations are evolving. And the emphasis that we're putting on mobility, reactivity, uh, uh, results in more requests from us on helicopters, uh, any means of uh, quick rapid transportation, quick reaction forces, intelligence capacities, and so on and so forth. So we, uh, of course, ID, counter ID units. So we continue to depend on our peacekeeping, on our troop and police contributing countries for that. But we also need their support uh, so that we can go forward and implement uh, our various uh, work strand, our, our various strategies um, uh, on digital transformation, on increasing the number of women and the role of women in peacekeeping with the LC uh, initiative and, and, and many other work strands for which uh, we need expertise from our member states and also support, including support by voluntary funding. Now, um, if I look beyond this uh, uh, efforts at improving the tool that is peacekeeping, I think that uh, more efforts to uh, try to address uh, the emerging or, or uh, you know, maybe not so emerging anymore drivers of conflict that, are that I've mentioned uh, are very important. Of course, climate change uh, cannot be uh, solved by peacekeeping oppression, but uh, we need and we, we probably can do more, but uh, that would require more partnership to, to mitigate the impact of uh, climate change. And you know, one example is the uh, exacerbated tension between farmers and herders, and herders in, uh, uh, in Africa, uh, where we have uh, started implementing a few programs aimed at deconflicting, but we need to do more. Um, the, I think the, the, the other example I would put forward is the, the growing uh, uh, impact of uh, transnational criminal activities. And this is where I believe our system uh, can and should do more. Um, uh, the, there's a lot that is being done, of course, by the UNODC in Vienna, but I definitely believe that uh, uh, the, the, the magnitude of this challenge and its destabilizing impact on peace and security would warrant that. Uh, you know, we, we do more on this. And the problem with uh, uh, these uh, drivers of conflict um, is that they are, uh, most of them, actually all of them are of a regional and global nature. 
And you know, peacekeeping is essentially uh, based on, uh, you know, it's, it's peacekeeping operations are deployed on in one state uh, in, in most cases. I mean, sometimes the, uh, the notion of, you know, what belongs to whom is, uh, of course, uh, is significant in some of our peacekeeping mission. But essentially, they're, they're very uh, nation based. And, and that uh, creates, you know, that, 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 that is a problem when it comes to making more efforts to deal with those regional uh, and, and global uh, drivers of conflict. And here, I believe that more integration across the system and with our partners would be needed. Finally, uh, and, and I will uh, stop here, uh, what, uh, uh, that sometimes the, the question is, is posed, um, you know, what uh, is the relevance of peacekeeping operation where there's no peace to, to keep and, and, uh, and, and shouldn't there be a better solution with, for example, uh, regional peace enforcement uh, uh, forces? Um, I think uh, it's clear that uh, peacekeeping, uh, even robust peacekeeping with robust mandates, you know, chapter seven mandates, and, um, and, and with the right mindset, the right understanding of the mandate, uh, uh, is, uh, is not waging war. And I think it will never be like waging war. I think there's, there's a limit to what peacekeeping operation can do, uh, even, as I said, with the robust mandate. Uh, so definitely there is a space for, um, um, and, and just talking about security dimension of resolving conflict, because of course there are many other dimensions, but there, there certainly is more space for uh, uh, regional uh, peace enforcement or so-called peace enforcement forces. And we've always been supportive at the UN of uh, a greater support to these uh, regional forces, particularly in Africa. I have to say though that uh, uh, the, the challenge for uh, uh, these regional forces to be effective are, are many, and I believe that this will be a long-term effort before we can see, and particularly in Africa, before we can see effective and well-integrated and, and well-operated uh, regional peace enforcement forces. So it's not only a question of financial resources, financial resources would be important for that, but it's not only a question of financial resources. So I think uh, this is the topic that uh, would require a long-term effort. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, long-term is not always, uh, uh, you know, the, um, the, 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 the vision and the horizon of, uh, uh, of uh, the UN and, and certainly even less so with all due respect to our member states. Uh, uh, and, and that is, uh, of course, an obstacle to uh, what would be, I think, uh, needed, which is a, a sort of sustained program of a decade of uh, greater support to these efforts at uh, putting in place uh, regional capacity, particularly in Africa for peace enforcement. So I think I will stop here. I look forward to your question. And of course, I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Under Secretary General. Um, that was a, a very comprehensive and, and, and frank presentation of the challenges and your responses. Um, could I, I start with some of the questions? And the first one, and just to fit on what you, the topic you finished on was funding. Um, Peacekeeping is a very expensive um, operation. It's expensive in uh, troop deployments, uh, equipment, support staff. Um, and we have seen uh, that the previous US administration decided to reduce funding. Um, has this impacted on the mission areas that you are responsible for? And I suppose if you could put a rider on top of that, as we face into a potentially a global recession, will the lack of funds impact further on the mission areas? Thank you. Well, um, <clears throat> I think, uh, first of all, it's important to uh, put uh, the cost of peacekeeping is in perspective. Uh, the current budget of peacekeeping operation is about $6 billion per year, uh, and we have close to between 90,000 and 100,000 personnel deployed on the ground uh, in 12 different missions. Now, $6 billion is more or less the same uh, annual budget as uh, the annual budget of the uh, New York uh, City Police Department. Um, so, and, and, and of course, uh, New York is relatively safe, but you, you still have 
uh, issues uh, in, in, of crime in, in, and violence in, in that city. Um, so another uh, um, indicator is uh, the often uh, mentioned uh, figure of 0.5%, you know, the peacekeeping uh, annual uh, budget uh, corresponds more or less to 0.5% uh, of uh, and total uh, uh, defense-related uh, expenditures in the in the world uh, each year. So I, I think it's uh, uh, you know it's fair to make the point that peacekeeping is not that expensive after all. And uh, there are many uh, researchers uh, who highlighted the fact that uh, uh, the, the 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 bang for the buck, so to speak, uh, uh, was quite. Uh, uh, was quite positive and 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 good for uh, uh, the service that provides peacekeeping, even though, as I say, we would wish to uh, be able to achieve uh, more often what I call the ultimate goal of peacekeeping, uh, which is to to be able to draw down and leave and leave behind us uh, durable peace. Now, um, yes, we we had some uh, uh, additional pressure on our. On the peacekeeping budget uh, over the last year, particularly with the previous U.S. administration, I have to say though that uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, a, a degree of pressure on our budget is not necessarily unhealthy. I mean, I, th I think you know we, we we are answerable to our member states, and we need to be prudent when it comes to using our resources. Uh, second thing is that in the end. Uh, the even though there was uh, and in a way still is and not only uh, it's not only the US to be fair uh, there is a sort of background uh, music or background noise you know pointing to the need of uh, you know uh, being uh, prudent uh, and when it comes to our budget um, we 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 saw uh, we 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 haven't seen uh, uh, a, a very significant impact on our peacekeeping operation. We saw some of it, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, we we would, of course, we could use more resources on, on uh, particularly given the importance of the threats against our peacekeepers. And uh, that, that is really the point that I try to emphasize when I discuss on uh, budget-related issues. Uh, but uh, the overall, um, Coming back to the previous U.S. administration, the overall sort of uh, sense that you know peacekeeping budget had to be reduced, uh, uh, in the end, uh, did translate in a very much case by case and pragmatic approach to each peacekeeping operations. Now, moving forward, I think you're right. I mean, we don't know what the impact of the current crisis will be on uh, the public finances of our member states, and this is something on which we don't have we don't have any leverage. The only thing on which we have leverage. Is is to continue our efforts to make sure that peacekeeping operations will be as effective uh, and as impactful as possible. Um, uh, that, that is really where uh, we, we have leverage. And uh, that, that, that is why uh, we are determined to not only continue, but step up our efforts on the various A4P and A4P plus priorities that I mentioned earlier. Thank you for that. I'm going to go to questions uh, now that are coming from our contributors. Uh, the first I have here is from Keen Fitzgerald, no relation. Um, he is uh, the defence researcher here in the IIEA. Um, as peacekeeping operations have become more complicated, intensive and dangerous, is there a potential that the increased demands on present peacekeeping operations will create further divides among funding contributing countries and troop contributing countries? Well, um, you know, we, um, we are in, in a situation where, um, because of the divisions uh, of, uh, across, you know, in, in our membership, uh, I don't think, but I may be wrong. I, I don't think that uh, uh, we uh, we have um, prospects of uh, uh, creation of new peacekeeping operations anytime soon, because <clears throat> the, the 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 creation of a peacekeeping operation assumes uh, or can happen in 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 a given in given conditions where 
on the one hand, the international community the security council determines that something has to be done on a given situation, but then uh, that our member states and particularly the most influential ones uh, are not interested in, uh, in, in, you know, getting involved uh, on a national uh, basis or, or uh, to put it differently, uh, in situations where the, the competitive spirit uh, does not prevail over the uh, multilateral approach. And unfortunately, we are in a situation where the, the competition across, you know, amongst our member states is, is, is growing and, and therefore the appetite to, to, to deal uh, or, or to bring responses to uh, a crisis uh, through uh, multilateral action is, is diminishing. And, and I think that is why, uh, uh, even though one could have imagined with a more united international, international community uh, peacekeeping uh, efforts uh, in uh, situations such as uh, Yemen or, or, or Syria, uh, that uh, or even Libya, uh, you know, with more unity and, and more united pressure on the parties, that, that is not the case. Now, uh, on the one, on, on the other hand, of course, we, we do uh, demand more um, from our member states in, in terms of uh, uh, the right capacities and also in terms of uh, making sure that we have adequate resources. Now, um, and of course, our true contributing countries uh, are uh, making the point that uh, uh, they, um, yes, they, 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 they have their own responsibility in providing us with the right uh, capacities, well-trained, well-equipped, and so on and so forth, but they also rightly make the point that they need uh, those adequate uh, resources. Um, I... Um, you know, I, I think that we're, we're not seeing uh, uh, an increasingly uh, um, significant divide, uh, um, you know, between, let's say, the, those who are, um, you know, paying the most and who, those who are, uh, um, you know, the, the biggest true contributing countries. Um, I, I believe that uh, uh, what is important is to uh, for us to continue to engage the, the, our membership as a whole, uh, impressing upon them uh, the the challenges that uh, we face, impressing upon them uh, also what we achieve uh, and 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 how we can work together uh, so that we can continue to to. Uh, to better or to, to deliver on the mandate that are given to us uh, in the best possible conditions. Now, it is also important for us to make sure that we retain uh, as much as possible geographical balance in our true contributing countries and therefore uh, the importance of having uh, TCCs from uh, um, not only from uh, uh, Asia or Africa, the global south, of course, they're much appreciated, but also from uh, Europe uh, the American continent and uh, uh, the, uh, you know, countries in Asia with an advanced economy, all of this is, is also very much important because that also creates a greater commonality in terms of uh, uh, the understanding uh, of uh, the, the challenges of peacekeeping and, uh, and, and also uh, more unity in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the actual involvement of our member states in the ground, uh, you know, on the ground with us in peacekeeping operations. Um, the next question is, is coming from Porik Murphy, who is a member of the Institute, and he asks, um, can you give us uh, an idea why some 30 member states did not support the most recent initiative uh, in the UN regarding peacekeeping? Um, <clears throat> I... Um... I would like to to ask, I mean, to respond with the question: What initiative exactly are you uh, are you talking about? No, I'm afraid I, I can't help you in that. And, okay, and, and perhaps Parik might come back on that one. And if you like, we can move on to uh, another yeah. question. I mean, I, I might, you know, make just a few uh, comments. You know, overall. Uh, I believe, and this is not, uh, you know, the, this is truly what, what, what I believe that uh, peacekeeping benefits from, and relative to many other activities by the UN, benefits from uh, quite a large degree of support. Uh, you know, we saw that when we submitted to the member states the declaration of shared commitment that, that I mentioned earlier, you know, with the 
154 member states subscribing to the document, which is uh, more than three quarters of the uh, of the membership. And I think that the, the reason why we're having this uh, high level of support is it's because the peacekeeping is very much it's a very broad partnership in, in the in the UN. You know, m m the vast majority of our member states are involved one way or another in peacekeeping, either because they are troop or police contributing country or they are, or because they are in involved or interested in a given situation where peacekeeping is active or because they're a member of the Security Council, uh, of financial contributors and so on and so forth. Uh, we have 120 troop and police contributing countries. So only that, you know, uh, creates quite a significant constituency for peacekeeping. And if you add to that, again, the other member states who would have an interest in peacekeeping for other reason, I think you end up with a very large uh, partnership and, and frankly, with a, a very significant base of support for peacekeeping. So I'm not too worried. Of course, we need to maintain that uh, level of strong support, but I'm not too worried about uh, the, uh, you know, peacekeeping um, uh, in, in you know not being supported enough by member states in principle but of course uh, we we push for actual support on political and and, and capacity and financial uh, uh, support that that is quite clear we'll continue to push uh, for that um i'm going to to blend some questions together because we have quite an amount of questions coming in um the first of these would be from uh Jera Hearn, who's a retired Brigadier General and has a extensive overseas experience. Um, uh, do you have any concerns from the international optics perspective that the soldiers deploying to UN peacekeeping missions have for some time and continuing are predominantly, predominantly from African and Asian countries? I'm going to blend that one with uh, another question from Keen Fitzgerald. He said, if you uh, incorporate the uh, war that's taking place in Ukraine, is it feasible that some countries will say it is time for us to build up our own defenses and perhaps we cannot spare any resources to UN missions? Um. All right. Well, on the first question, um, I mean, we um, are very happy to have TCCs from from Africa and from from Asia, particularly South Asia, and, and uh, they account for uh, an important you know, percentage of uh, of the troops that are deployed and also police. But at the same time, and um, you know, they they the, they they also have, uh, particularly when it comes to um, some of the of the uh, uh, those troop contributing country, they can also provide us with the uh, with with an additional added value. Uh, you know, one example is uh, the recent deployment uh, of uh, units from Kenya and Tanzania in the eastern part of the DRC, uh, which uh, are Swahili speaking, which which also provides us with an additional sort of uh, advantage in in that region. But, but, but I think, as I indicated earlier, we, we also want to preserve and, and even enhance uh, a, a greater geographical balance uh, uh, when it comes to our troop and police contributing countries. So we're you know, very happy to have Ireland as a, a strong uh, troop contributing country for many decades. Uh, we, we also have other troop contributing countries from, from Europe. Um, but uh, it, it is important to 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 preserve that geographical balance uh, because peacekeeping is is a UN activity it has to be global it has to be representative of uh, our uh, geographical diversity. Now, when it comes to uh, Ukraine and the, uh, the the question that was posed about you know whether um, some countries would be sort of can, would, would eventually uh, 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 sort of uh, potentially deprioritize uh, peacekeeping relative to, to, to emerging needs for their defense. Um, we will see. Um, but what I noted is that, uh, you know, in talking particularly with the various uh, um, European countries at the senior level, um, 
Of course, Ukraine is an important priority to them. That's quite clear. But at the same time, and, and, and of course, from the even broader perspective, it, it's an additional element that further exacerbates the division you know, across our membership and the international community. That's quite clear. At the same time, I also perceive that uh, uh, there, was, uh, there still is a recognition that uh, the security challenges uh, uh, coming from the Middle East, coming from, from Africa, continue to be significant. Uh, from uh, a European perspective, being a European, I, I sort of can relate to that. Uh, so on the one hand, of course, uh, uh, countries that are most affected by the situation in Ukraine, yes, will have to, to make choices when it comes to allocation of their resources and how they, uh, you know, they, 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 they profile, they, they, uh, they, they determine the uh, the priorities within the sphere of their defense uh, spending. But at the same time, um, I, I take it also that uh, there is, uh, uh, as I say, uh, not only an understanding of the challenges coming from, from, from regions where our peacekeeping operations are deployed, but also another understanding, which is that a growing interconnection of these various conflicts uh, um, and of course, we're seeing that now with the impact of the uh, uh, Ukraine war uh, on uh, on food supply or on the global economy, uh, and and of course uh, the tensions that that will result in uh, the, the even greater tension that uh, may arise from uh, the situation that is uh, thus created. Uh, and I think the, the this growing understanding of this interconnection between the various conflicts, I, I believe, um, uh, sort of uh, enhances or, or, or warrants continuation of uh, efforts to mitigate and, and, and hopefully uh, deal with uh, successfully with the with the crisis that are um, that, that are still uh, you know very much active in, in in Africa, the Middle East, and you know these places where we have uh, the most of our peacekeeping missions deployed. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Francis O'Donnell. And Francis O'Donnell is a retired uh, UN senior official. And um, he has just returned from the ninth global Baku forum. And um, his question is, can you please share with us the state of play on negotiations between the secretary general and Martin Griffiths et al on relieving the Russian black blockade at Odessa? Can a peacekeeping operation be envisaged for an escort? And has Article 51 on collective defense been considered for a naval escort by a coalition of the willing in the case of Russian, if in the case that Russian continues to obstruct the grain export? Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh... You know, the, I, I'm afraid I, I won't be uh, able to to provide more detail, much details on on these negotiations because uh, uh, it, it's very much an ongoing uh, process, um, and also one on on which, uh, uh, as you uh, would recall, I mean, the the, the Secretary General has indicated that uh, 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 you know the the uh, it. it was probably more prudent to be uh, discreet as to exactly you know what uh, is uh, discussed but <clears throat> uh, it, it is clear that uh, those uh, discussions are ongoing that uh, you know they're, they're quite active uh, the press uh, reported on you know possibility of a meeting uh, between uh, uh, Russia Ukraine uh, Turkey and uh, and the United Nations uh, sometime soon um, but I don't have more elements on this. Um, clearly, uh, the importance of uh, finding a solution for the exports of grain, as well as to uh, the uh, um, exports of, uh, um, of uh, fertilizers, uh, is, is critically important. And, uh, um, you know, we're uh, already seeing in, in many of the countries in which we are deployed, uh, uh, quite a significant impact resulting from this crisis that comes on top of various other crises. Um, now, uh, again, on, on the specifics, I think it's uh, it, it, it would be uh, um, very much, uh, you know, speculative from me to sort of uh, uh, 
um, elaborate because uh, nobody knows exactly what the contours, what the, what the sort of uh, the modalities of uh, these uh, uh, mechanism uh, would be. Uh, you all noted that uh, they were, uh, of course, concerned about uh, uh, the uh, existence of mines, but at the same time, those mines, are, you know, and so including the sea mines, are also seen as, you know, uh, defensive by Ukraine. So that they're, they're all kind of a question of then uh, also inspections and uh, whether they would be and who would be. Uh, inspecting and monitoring and so on and so forth. So uh, these are the issues that are discussed, but uh, I, uh, uh, I, I'm not really able to provide more details on this uh, sort of very, very active <laughs> process. Uh, but I, I have to say that uh, it is critically important that uh, this uh, result in, uh, in a successful outcome and, and particularly as, uh, you know, responsible for peacekeeping operations and uh, with most of our peacekeeping operations deployed in countries where the impact of uh, the current crisis is, uh, is, is very, very significant and potentially very dangerous. Uh, thank you. Um, the next question is coming from Audrey McCready. And um, she would like if you could spend a little time expanding on the role of the female peacekeeper and how they are employed. Right. <clears throat> well, we, um, as I indicated, I mean, we, we're making a lot of efforts to have more women peacekeeping. And I, and I think for a number of reasons, one of them is that uh, in the end, you know, the UN is about gender equality. So we want peacekeeping to uh, reflect that priorities. And also we do believe that peacekeeping operations should be reflective of the uh, gender balance of our world. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and reflective of the, the, the gender balance of, uh, of our communities in which we operate. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we're also convinced that uh, um, with more women peacekeeping, we are becoming more effective in many ways. And one of them, but not the only one, is uh, in terms of our capacity to build trust with communities, because peacekeeping is very much about engaging communities, particularly with vulnerable communities. And sometimes, very often, actually, it's very much about uh, women and, and children and, and, and traumatized women and children uh, who are not particularly keen to see more men with weapons. Um, and therefore, uh, we see that, uh, you know, with uh, women, uh, you know, being with us and uh, being uh, in a position to engage with these communities, we're much better at building trust and, and, and therefore being more effective. But that's not the only reason. Uh, I also, frankly, I mean, we, we, we are convinced and we see that uh, there's no uh, function peacekeeping that cannot be either carried out, carried out either by men or, or women. Uh, but we also see that whenever we have more women in peacekeeping, then we have a better work environment. Uh, and also an environment that is less conducive to uh, issues uh, related to conduct and discipline, including sexual exploitation and abuse. Now, um, even as uh, the proportion of women peacekeeping is improving, I believe we have more to do. And, and, and there are a couple of things. First, I mentioned the fact that we don't have enough women in military form units, and that's because of the resource that is still not sufficient. We would like to have more female uh, generals uh, in peacekeeping. Actually, we, we have more than before, including Major General O'Brien from Ireland, who is the deputy uh, Milad here. Um, and we have a couple of forest commander, or deputy forest commander, but uh, we don't have enough and the resource is still limited. Now, the other thing we need to do is to go beyond the numbers and also look at what we could do to make peacekeeping more welcoming for women. And here, there are a number of things we need to work on. One of them is the, uh, the facilities, I mean, the sort of practical infrastructure of peacekeeping uh, uh, that need to be uh, adapted so that women can be you know, can feel as comfortable as men uh, uh, in uh, our camps and, 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 uh, and bases. The, the other thing is making sure that uh, uh, with more training and more sensitization, we uh, convince everyone to um, 
to have the right attitude when it comes to making the work environment welcoming to women and frankly also to men because I don't believe that a work environment that is not welcoming to men can to women can really be a healthy work environment even for for men so there, there still is a lot that needs to be done and we count on the support of our member state as well to go forward and, and further on this uh, unfortunately we have run out of time um, so it remains for me to thank you but to tell you that i have left a large number of questions behind I have been unable so that your presentation has been hugely popular with our members. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to give us this presentation and the update on peacekeeping. And to all of the other contributors, my apologies for not getting to your questions. And to all of you online, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the pleasure was mine. Thank you.